So uh, before we get started, we just want to ask that if you're so inclined to support the museum, so please consider making a donation or becoming a museum member. And both of those can be done on our website. Uh, you can stay in touch. So visit our website, uh, transconamuseum.mb.ca. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, maybe you already are if you're watching the live, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, we have a blog as well. And you can join our email mailing list. Uh, we send out an e-newsletter once, maybe twice a month. Uh, we don't spam your inboxes. So it's just a way you can keep up to date with what's going on at the museum. The Transcona Museum would like to acknowledge that we reside on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. So now we're going to talk about the incredible true story of the 1930 Transcona Bank robbery that actually kind of ended in an axe murder, not clickbait. So chapter one, we're going to talk about the robbery. So let's set the scene. This is the Transcona Museum today. Uh, this is the building that we're in. But this is actually what the building originally looked like, and it was the Bank of Toronto. Now, we actually don't have any interior photographs of what the bank looked like when it was a bank. But after the bank moved out, uh, the building became the Transcona Municipal Office. So we have a couple of photos that show what the interior looked like when it was the municipal offices. So we're just having to assume that the layout was somewhat similar. Uh, so this is an interior shot of the municipal offices. That arrow is pointing to the second floor door. That is a gate door that would have let uh, employees get behind the wickets behind the teller stations. And then there is this desk near a window, a, like a little ledge where you could fill out paperwork. Remember this desk window, it plays a part. So this is looking more towards the middle of the bank municipal office. So what you can see is the vault doors and a door leading into the basement of the bank or municipal office when this photo was taken. So we've sort of shown what it looked like when it was the, what we can assume what it, the layout was like when it was the bank. Now, this is what the layout looks like currently. So pointing out the vault over here and that same door to the second floor here. Uh, the door to the basement has moved uh, once an addition was put on in the 50s. And that window ledge would be over here always. So this is what the interior looks like. But again, there are no teller wickets or anything like that. So using the power of Photoshop, I drew this up to sort of show you what the layout would have looked like uh, with the wickets in place, how the museum is currently set up. So we have an idea of what the layout of the bank looked like. We, um, so next what we're gonna do is we're going to do a very inaccurate <laughs> representation of what happened, a walkthrough of the robbery. Now due to current regulations, we can't have the same number of people in the museum to illustrate what happened. So we're in improvising. Okay, so now I am going to uh, There, hi. <laughs> so we're going to turn this around and we're going to walk you through what actually happened. Okay, so First of all, we're going to introduce who was in the bank. So in the bank as employees were Robert Gunning and Hilton Head, and they were the tellers that worked um, at the ticket wicket and the bank manager, J.B. Simpson, uh, he was working in the bank manager's office. So these were the employees in the building when the robbery happened. Now there were also customers in the building when it happened. So there was Mrs. Banak, and she actually had a baby with her. Then there was an M. Irwin, Andrew Crawford, and Dan Ketliner. 
uh, and he was actually by that window uh, filling out paperwork. Now there is one more player uh, involved and that was Edna Neal and she actually worked at the post office across the street. So she's gonna come into play with this as well. So these are the people who were in the bank when the robbery happened. So at 10.15 on October 16th, 1930, just after the Bank of Toronto opened for the day, uh, three men entered the bank, Lester Gwynn, Joseph Wairzeb, and Harry Herman. So these are portrayed by Jennifer and our two flamingos. So one of the men went into the bank manager's office to get the bank manager, J.B. Simpson. The two other men approached the customers and the tellers. The tellers did not actually have time to reach for the revolvers that they had at their stations. So the men told the customers and the tellers that they didn't want to hurt anyone or anyone to come into any harm and told them to reach for the sky. Now remember, Dan Ketliner was filling out a receipt at the desk near the window. So the bank manager Simpson was directed into the main area at gunpoint and he, along with all the customers and the tellers were herded into the bank vault. So now we're taking everyone over to the bank vaults. Now, interestingly enough, there actually was an unloaded rifle in the vault and it was actually just being stored there as it was a hunting rifle. So once they were inside the vault, one of the masked men told them that the lights would stay on and tossed them a screwdriver so they could get themselves out because bank vaults apparently had a safety system where you could get out with a screwdriver. So then the masked men filled a brown bag of money from the teller's station uh, drawers and the men robbed the bank following payday at the Transcona shops where there was more cash on hand and made away with approximately $12,000, uh, which equals about $177,000 today. But interestingly enough, there was much more money actually in the vault, but they didn't rob the vault, just the teller drawers. Now, across the street, Edna Neal, a clerk at the Transcona post office, said she had seen three men enter the bank. She had seen people with their hands up and then saw the men uh, exit the building in a hurry a few minutes later. So she called the police. So the men exited the bank and got into a waiting blue sedan driven by a fourth accomplice, Mike slash Shorty. And they sped away west down Regent Avenue uh, towards Winnipeg. So everyone was able to exit the vault after a few minutes. Uh, Mrs. Banuk had been feeling faint, but recovered after the vault doors were opened. So no employees or customers were harmed during the bank robbery. And that was our very inaccurate walkthrough of what actually happened um, during the bank robbery. But that's not the end of the story. Yes, ta-da, and scene. So we are going to go through the rest of what happened. So, let's see if I can get this working again. There. So, uh, when it, this is a copy of the Winnipeg Tribune um, from October 16th. Bank of Toronto, Transcona held up, robbed of $12,000. So, a photo here. This is the bank. This is a picture of the vault. And these three men here, those were the employees of the bank, not they were represented by flamingos. Uh, this is the front page news, October 16th, again, from the Winnipeg Evening Tribune. So three employees, three male customers, and a woman with baby in arms. Uh, forced to comply with demands of trio, girl across the street sees robbers flee in blue sedan. So chapter two, the search is on. By evening, both the Winnipeg police and the Transcona police were working together, but found few clues at the scene. Based on the circumstances of the robbery, the police believe that the robbery of the bank and the Canadian Malting Company, uh, which the day before uh, had been robbed, uh, they thought it might be the same gang, but this actually proved to be untrue. 
So the police served, searched dives, pool rooms, hotels, and rooming houses in Winnipeg, watched all roads leading out of the city and issue warnings to the towns along the U.S.-Canada border to be on the lookout. The Canadian Bankers Association even offered a reward for any information leading to an arrest. As a result, the police questioned over 200 possible suspects and arrested three of the men responsible, as, one of, as well as one of the wives. So again, Manitoba Free Press, October 17th. Winnipeg Evening Tribune from October 17th. So the suspects, let's learn a little bit more about that. Harry Herman, he was born in Russia in 1891 and came to Canada with his parents in 1913. He was living in Winnipeg by 1926 with his wife, Rachel, and their five children. He operated the Herman Raw Fur Company, which went bankrupt in 1930, and was well known in the community. He was arrested at his residence located at 571 Alfred Avenue in Winnipeg in the North End. Joseph Hudson Wirezub, he was born in New York and came to Canada as a child or was born in Ukraine and came to Canada around 1914. It's a little unclear. He was arrested at a rooming house on McDonald Avenue, so by the exchange. His wife, Doris, was also ar arrested and was held as a material witness. He spent eight years in jail on previous charges from vagrancy to robbery. He was previously suspected of robbing the Rex Cafe in Dauphin, but later released due to lack of evidence. Lester Gwynn, or Leslie B. Gwynn, described in the newspapers as a transient residing on Higgins, came from the US, recently arriving in Winnipeg from the Paw and Flin Flon. He made a full confession when arrested and claimed that Herman was the mastermind of the robbery. And this gentleman was identified by the bank manager, J.B. Simpson, because he was not wearing a mask. The other two gentlemen in the robbery were wearing masks. So the plan and the fallout. So the plan according to Herman's testimony. In late September 1930, Wyrezub and Herman met at the home of John Powak, supplier of the guns used in the robbery. They were joined by another man known only as Mike or Shorty. He was the getaway driver. The group drove to Transcona to observe the bank. Ten days later, Herman met up again with Wyrezub and Powak and was introduced to Wyrezob's friend from the US, Lester Gwynn. Gwynn stole a car on Higgins Avenue and replaced the plates. On October 17th, the group, Herman, Wyrezob, Gwynn, and Mike Shorty, drove to Transcona, but the bank was too busy. The group went back the next day and successfully robbed the bank. So actually that should be October 15th because the bank robbery happened on the 16th, I believe. According to Herman, he was forced to go into the bank and steal the money while the others managed the customers and employees. After the robbery, the group drove to Elmwood and separated, two taking the streetcar and others driving. They met again at the Sanderson's block on Main Street, where they used an acquaintance's apartment to divide the money. The bag was supposedly thrown off the Norwood Bridge into the Red River. Rai, Rezeb, and Gwen then went to a beer parlor on Gary Street, and later took a taxi to Selkirk, East Selkirk, for more drinks. Herman went home to his family, and Mike Shorty, he vanished from Winnipeg. So, the trial. So, on October 20th, charges laid against all three suspects for an armed robbery and theft. October 22nd, police start dragging uh, a dragging operation on the Red River to find the bag, which was thought to contain some of the stolen money, masks, overalls, and guns. This proved to be unsuccessful. On October 23rd, Herman gets a lawyer, makes a full confession, and turns King's evidence, which means he gave information to the court in order to reduce his sentence. Gwyn and Raiza both elected to stand for jury trial. On October 29th, Herman was sent to, sentenced to three years at Stony Mountain Penitentiary for his part in the robbery. Uh, he claimed to have built up a gambling debt, and that's why he participated. A resident at the rooming house where Wyrezub and his wife were staying found some of the stolen money in the bathroom. 
a cashier at Hudson's Bay Company testified that on the day of the robbery, Herman paid his account uh, with new Bank of Toronto bills. And interestingly enough, the Bank of Toronto could actually print their own money at this point in time. So very suspicious. On November 26th, Pawax was sentenced for supplying guns for the robbery. Gwyn and Y. Rezub pled guilty, with Gwyn making a full confession and claiming Herman was the mastermind of the robbery. On November 29th, Y. Rezub was sentenced to 15 years in prison and 10 lashings for his role in the robbery. Gwen was sentenced to five years in prison and 10 lashes. So only a very small portion of the full 12,000 was ever recovered by the police. The trial was touted as, one of being, as being one of the largest robbery trials in Winnipeg history with over 30 witnesses and many people wanting to watch the trial. So this is the Winnipeg Evening Tr Tribune from October 29th. So only 3,000 recovered by police of the 12,000 stolen. So an escape attempt, chapter six, the story continues. So in December, 1930, Doris Rirasub was arrested for attempting to aid her husband in an escape attempt. She attempted to smuggle five hacksaw blades in a jar of jam. Doris was initially charged, but later acquitted in January 1931, claiming she didn't know that the saw blades were in the jam. The jam had apparently been given to her by an unknown stranger, potential friend of her husband's, who knows? So uh, Winnipeg Free Press from December 2nd, attempt to aid escape charge. So remember that fourth man, Mike Shorty, the guy who disappeared from Winnipeg? What happened to him? So on November 19th, an arrest warrant was put out for Frank Bodnar in connection with the bank robbery. He was also known as Mike Shorty. Uh, the real man's name was thought to be Mike Kostuk. He had, he had a previous arrest record for robbery and vagrancy. So after taking his share of the money, Bodnar hid in the north end of Winnipeg for several days but before traveling north to Riverton, Manitoba. He then traveled further west before making his way to the US. Once he was identified by police, circulars with his description and fingerprints were sent all over Canada and the US. In June, 1931, a railway patrol officer in Cedar Rapids, Michigan came across four men sleeping in a boxcar. When he ordered them to leave, one of the men pulled a gun resulting in a shootout and his death. An immigration card found on the body read Lucas Roman Pucholsky of Michigan, but his fingerprints revealed that he was Bodner. Bodner, or Banner, was previously arrested in Winnipeg 1922 for shop breaking and theft. He was 24 years old at the time and had served two years in prison. He was arrested along with John Pawak. You remember the supplier for the guns for the robbery? Mm. So this is a, a photo that was supplied to us from the Winnipeg Police Museum, and it was those 1922 arrest records. So here you can see my mouse, John Pawak, and Frank Bodnar Banner. So chapter eight, the fate of the others. So Lester Gwynn, he was most likely deported back to the US after his re release from prison. Joseph Wyrezub, he divorced his wife Doris in 1943, you know, the one who tried to break him out of jail, continued his troubles with the law, and in 1944 was shot by a fellow conspirator while robbing another bank. Uh, he was arrested in 1945, so he survived being shot, and 1965 for theft. The newspapers claimed he had a criminal record going as far back as 1916. He died in January 1970 at the age of 70 and is buried in the All Saints Cemetery in Winnipeg. Harry Herman moved with his family to Regina, where he then left them. He later moved to Vancouver and worked in the fur business until his death in 1964. Rachel Herman returned to Winnipeg with their oldest son, John. She was murdered in May 1946 from axe wounds received by Abraham Goodman, a local baker. 
she had rejected his advances and proposals of marriage. She's buried next to Harry at the Benet Abraham Cemetery in West St. Paul. So this is when we'd like to open it up that if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to, if you're on Zoom, leave it in the chat. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, leave us a comment and we can answer the question. But if you can't think of any questions right now, please don't hesitate to ask us, um, send us an email, send us a message on social media, comment on the video after it has um, been posted. We're not quite sure how these Facebook Lives work 100% yet. Okay. So again, if you enjoyed this video, um, please consider supporting the museum. Uh, you can make a donation or you can become a museum member. And again, that is all available on our website, transconamuseum.mb.ca. Um, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, blog, and we have a blog. And all of our Small Talk Tuesdays that we were doing during lockdown, we recorded and they're posted up on our YouTube channel. You can join our mailing list. Uh, again, we send out monthly e-newsletters. And we also have upcoming small talks uh, planned for July and August. So these talks are available both online through Zoom, as well as we have a few tickets available for in-house um, participants. So on July 7th, we're looking at the early schools of early Transcona, July 14th, one man, a camera, and 20,000 slides. We're looking at the J.R. Armour collection. On July 21st, the power and the history of the insulator. And July 28th, adventures in heritage cooking. And beginning in July, uh, check out our social media where we will be posting a historic recipe that we're asking people to try out. And then um, we're gonna have a conversation about with our adventures in heritage cooking presentation. In August, uh, we're going to be doing a virtual tour of the Transcona Cemetery on August 11th, August 18th, snapshot, a look through the 1960s Transcona, and we will be using a negative collection that we have that comes from the Transcona newspaper. So we were able to cross-reference the negatives with the newspapers so we know what events they are, who's in them, and what was going on. And Tuesday, August 25th, we're going to be talking about what's missing from the museum's collection. We have over 50,000 items in our collection, but there are definite gaps and holes in the history of Transcona. So we'll be talking about what they are and items that we're interested in adding to the collection so we can better tell the history and the stories and the community spirit of Transcona. So if you're interested in any of those, you can RSVP on our website for the Zoom link or RSVP for your ticket. Uh, they are free, uh, but the space is limited. So you will need a ticket to attend those uh, small talks. Thank you everyone for watching our Facebook Live, joining us on Zoom today, and we hope that you'll join us again. Okay, bye.